All righty. Welcome to, I, I got two things playing in my ear. It's kind of funny here. I did this a little wrong. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to another wonderful episode here on the Freedom Media Network today. Joining us today, we have Anthony Herrera, the founding executive director of Furman Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Furman University, recognized by US News and World Report as the number five most innovative colleges Firm in innovation and entrepreneurship exist to develop innovative and entrepreneurial minded leaders who are equipped to transform our communities and the world through social and entrepreneurial ventures. We'll talk more about all of that and more today. Anthony, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Kurt, thank you so much. That was a mouthful, right? I, we need to figure out how to shorten uh, that introduction of what Firm in Innovation does, but I, I know we're going to get an, into that in this, in this show. So uh, glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. Pleasure to have you. And by the way, we got people joining us from Facebook, from LinkedIn, from YouTube, from Twitter, wherever in the world you're joining us from. Don't be a lurker. Jump in. Share your name, your city, your state, your town, your where in the world you're joining us from, your continent, whatever it is. Don't be a lurker. Jump in. And as we go, share your comments, your agreements, your disagreements, whatever it is, emotional outbursts, please. If you do have any disagreements, make sure though to address those to Anthony and not me. Um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll give a shout out to some of those content, uh, those comments as we go. We got Jorge from Brazil joining us today. And I'll put your, con your comment here on the screen as well. And we got Eric joining us from Texas. And Anthony, you are a former Texas resident yourself, it. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Love Texas. So we got we have folks joining us here. And uh, I try to navigate the st stream yard and all the various places here, which some places make it easier or harder than others to, to see who's joining us. So, Anthony, you have a career that spans the private sector over to higher education, back and forth and back and forth. And I want to get into that today, because especially in light of what's going on right now in the world, uh, for those of you who are not aware, we have a little thing called COVID that's been going on for the last five years that is shaking up uh, education, uh, higher elementary, secondary education, as well as uh, every business on the planet. But before we get started, this is the Freedom Media Network. So I'd like to ask you that word freedom. What does that word freedom mean to you, Anthony? Gosh, that's a great question. I think freedom um, means just kind of the, I think of freedom as being able to do what you want, when you want, and how you want. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, I've been asking that question from people for three years and it, there's always a variety of answers and, you know, some of them are economic, some of them are social, some of them are political, some of them have nothing to do with that, the freedom to be creative, et cetera, which goes to the heart that, that creativity really goes to the heart of, of business, of education, the, the freedom of expression, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd love to, um, for you to let everyone know, I mean, right now you're at Furman Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Furman University, right here in, in, in the common state of, of South Carolina. We're about probably three hours, three-ish hours away from one another. I'm in the lower part of the state. You're in the upper part of the state. But you've, you've gone back and forth between uh, the private sector and, and higher ed. Uh, I want to get into that and, and, and kind of your outlook for where things are going in that regard. And why that connection is so important to fuel right. innovation and entrepreneurship, not just not just entrepreneurs per se, but entrepreneurial ecosystems within large corporations, which you have uh, experience in. But can you tell us what brought you to this point? Because it's fascinating in terms of kind of going back and forth and, and you're seeing really both sides of the coin where, where most people see one side or the other side. And, and you've really been at the forefront of both. You're right. You know, Kurt, it's interesting because if you would have asked me when I was in my youth, am I an entrepreneur? And I said, no, uh, you know, I, I don't even know if I knew what an entrepreneur was or even how to spell the word entrepreneur. And, you know, you fast forward and I, I wholeheartedly view myself as an entrepreneur, right? Somebody who is innovative, creative, challenging the status quo. And my background, as you said, is, it's kind of been varied. I've been in, in higher ed at, you know, three private universities. Um, in big corporations. Most recently, I led executive leadership development at Toyota North America. And um, and then I, I started my career, probably what you would think is the least most innovative industries is in accounting as an auditor and a tax accountant at KPMG, right? So, um, and then I've in between, I've gravitated to leadership and executive recruiting 
uh, and coaching uh, rising leaders. What's the, the the biggest difference that you that you see between leadership within higher ed and leadership within uh, a corporation like you know KPMG? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because there are actually more similarities than differences, right? And and what it comes down to, it's about the people, right? It's about a culture. Right? I, I always say. If you want a, or an innovative company, an innovative organization, reg regardless whether it's higher ed or a corporation, um, you have to have an innovative culture. And if you want an innovative culture, you have to have innovative leaders, right? So you're, it's always going to get narrowed down to the, to the individuals, the, the people that are leading the organization. And those have skill sets um, and competencies. Those organizations that are most innovative, they have leaders that have these skill sets, right? They're, they are willing to take risks, calculated risks, right? Um, they are willing to, you know, they can deal with ambiguity, right? They're problem solvers. Um, they challenge the status quo, right? How often, you know, do you hear somebody saying, well, that's that's just not the way we do it, right? And that right there, just when you hear that come out, um, that's a recipe for, a dis you know, disaster, right? That, that means they're not going to be innovative and they're not going to adapt. They're not going to change. Yeah. And, and, and I want to give a shout out. Ari Weinstein from Hudson Valley, New York joins us, says hello. And Matthew Gardner joins us and says innovation is key to success in business right now. But that word innovation, I'd like to focus on it because a lot of folks throw that word around and maybe uh, they think it means something different than either it actually means or they're thinking of something different than you and I would think of it as, you know, especially within education, right? Uh, specifically, I, I would say, well, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen it in higher ed, but for instance, uh, like high school ed and, and, you know, I have a friend in Texas who is a teacher and he says, you know, we're being very innovative, 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 but doesn't it, doesn't that rely or doesn't that depend on what your goal is? So for instance, his idea of innovation within high school education might mean they're doing something that they weren't doing five years ago, but does that mean it's truly innovative? And what's the goal, right? What if, if, if your goal is simply making it into college, is that the end goal? Is that an outcome? Is that the input? So when you're really looking at those outcomes you want to achieve, um, how does that change depending on where you're at the, the, that word innovation, right? Because you could just say, we're doing something different. I came in and we're doing so, and I'm sure you've seen that, right? Oh, we're so innovative because we're doing something we've never done before. And you might be scratching your head thinking, right. But the rest of the world is like 20 years ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're right. It's interesting and to the question that was asked, you know, innovation is so critical for business. I mean, innovation is so critical for every organization, regardless whether it's a business, nonprofit, for-profit, you know, higher ed, um, it, just for sustainability. Right. And so I, I, when I when I first got into higher ed and they started talking about innovation, you know, a lot of universities will create these centers, these institutes, or even these schools, and just slap it on on the side of the building, innovation, right? You know, the the college ex college, you know, whatever big donor gives them money, their name, and then College of Innovation, right? And that is to your point, that's not making them innovative, right? They're they're not changing anything. Maybe the building and the technology has been updated, but they're not doing anything different. However, I also think you know, it's all about, it's all relative to where that organization is, right? And so yeah. sometimes I think of innovation as just marginal incremental improvements, mm -hmm. enhancements, and changes, right? Um, when you think about just doing those marginal ones, and you if you can do those every day, every week, every year, over a period, you know, you can have dramatic change and adaptation for an organization. Um, and so, I, we like to think when we hear innovation or even entrepreneurship, we think of big, you know, technological advancements, you know, you know, Google when they started off, you know, Facebook when they first launched. And that's not to me what innovation is. It's like those incremental changes. And if once you build on those and you're constantly adapting and changing and growing, that's where you get that culture of innovation. Those leaders who drive that and understand that and are willing to to make those incremental changes, you're going to see some transformation within organizations. Yeah. And Eric Farber writes, a culture of innovation is important in any company. What, you know, what are the, what are the, the kind of the pillars or the foundation for, you know, that has to be laid for a culture of innovation to actually be present in an organization? I love, that's a great question. Cause it's, uh, there's, there's a couple things that have to be there. One, there has to be diversity, 
right? And we quickly, when we hear the word diversity, we think of, you know, ethnic minorities, uh, representation. That's one aspect, right? But there's also diversity of thought, right? Mm-hmm. You know, diversity of perspective. And so there needs to be diversity present, right? There needs to be a culture of inclusion, right? So you can't just have diverse thoughts, diverse perspectives, diverse backgrounds present. You got to then be able to say, okay, we want to hear from those individuals, right? You know, the solutions to the challenges and problems we're facing today are going to come from diverse perspectives and individuals. But you have diversity, you have inclusion, and there has to be that trust. And what that trust means is there has to be this ability that say, if I volunteer a solution to my leadership or my manager, or if I try out a certain incremental change within my organization and it fails, I'm not going to be reprimanded, right? I'm not going to be fired. I'm not going to be booted, right? I'm not going to lose the trust of of the team. Um, And so those three are, I think, are the key pillars, right? Diversity, inclusion, and trust. And if those are all present, you'll start to see a culture of innovation. I remember when I first started working here at Firm and my direct supervisor, the provost of the university, one of the first things out of his mind, right? He knew I was leading innovation entrepreneurship firm, right? He was asking me to be different, to be trained, create change. Um, He said, I have your back. I have your back, right? You know, so I took that as like, okay, I'm going to experiment on different programs and projects. And if it fails, I'm not going to, you know, get reprimanded for something. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we're going to have to try things out and they may not work. I love how you, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, you know, especially in this charged environment, right? And and what's going on in the world, people do think of that and, and immediately think, especially now black versus white or, you know, Hispanic or, you know. But that diversity of thought is so important because everyone is in a different place in terms of how they grew up, their background, their passion, their knowledge, their strengths, but also their programming, right? Right. And and some people may be analytical. Some people may be more strategic. Um, Some people may be neither. Some people are kind of trains on time type people. And if your team is built up of all of one of those, right? you're going to get stuck. You're going to get in that storming phase, right? There's every, there's the forming, the storming, the norming, performing. And if, and if you are kind of monolithic, you're going to get caught in that storming phase. But I I remember some, some pretty large organizations who were seen as successful, but it's, it's funny how outside world can see you as successful, maybe just because you've got a lot of money and you're a behemoth and you, you, you can knock other people over, but really behind the scenes, I remember you know, I, I was in public relations advertising and you would see the culture had to do with doing things specifically, not that we're going to move the ball forward, not that we're going to specifically in the in the term of advertising, move the needle in terms of public opinion, but what would get approved by the leadership of the organization, which is the wrong way to do it. Now, sometimes, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, clocks, right? A broken, what do they say? A broken clocks, right? Twice a day, right? So, so you would, if you spend enough money and throw enough money at it, sometimes you can move forward, but that's not truly right. building innovation, especially when you can even have a diverse team, right? But if, if the diversity of thought isn't, if you're not listened to, if you have a diverse team and let it go to waste and everything still has to funnel through the mindset of the leader, that's not leadership, is it? Right. No, you're absolutely right. You know, the leader, you, you can create a diverse team and not have any innovation occur, right? And, and and not have an inclusive, you know, environment. And so it's so critical that once you have the diverse team, diverse perspectives, diverse representation, you set your uh, the organization up to listen to those individuals and then empower them, right? And they're going to fail, right? You know, if, if you think about it, I remember, uh, you know, telling my boss one time, I said, if I come into your office and, and I'm hearing yes more than no, and I'm not doing something right. I'm not innovating because I should be hearing no more often because that means I'm pushing them. I'm pushing them to the, to the limits, right? I'm getting them to think, oh, that's a little uncomfortable. Let's not do that. And then it's incumbent on me to convince them that we need to do this, yeah. right? And, and, you know, and it's not being careless, right? I think a lot of times when we think, um, you know, when we take risk, it, it means to be careless. And it's not. It's about taking calculator risk is this idea of saying, hey, we're going to do this marginal incremental change. And what happens is you start to build that trust and the trust comes from a different you know, sides. One is you start building trust from leadership saying, hey, we've seen this individual or this team have a pattern of successful inter- incremental change, right? So that when you do come with a big idea or a big change, 
they're more apt to say, hey, yeah, let's go with that. Let's 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 go give it a try. Um, and so it's, I think it's so critical that we create that inclusion. Um, and to do that, part of it is not just listening. You can listen all the time and it just doesn't do anything. It's allowing you know, your team members to try something out. So let's talk about Furman entrepreneurship and inno- or innovation and entrepreneurship. And I know I gave that mouthful description at the beginning, uh, but let it, what's your mission? You know, what is the end game of why you, not you, but why the organization exists and where you want to take it? Kurt, I know we talked about this, you know, before it's, you know, we have this long mission and vision and objectives and I'm trying to clear, clearly state um, in almost one sentence what we do. So our, our mission, you know, we develop innovative and entrepreneurially minded leaders that are empowered to launch social and entrepreneurial ventures that can change our world. That's a lot, right? And that's great. <laughs> and that's what we need to do. But that doesn't resonate with anybody anymore, especially college students, right? They're like, ah, oh, okay. So I, I, we cleaned it up, right? I said, we help students launch ventures, right? Social or entrepreneurship ventures. Very clear. Everybody knows what we do. There's no cure, you know, question about, okay, what does this entity do for firm and students in the community? Um, and so our goal is to, one, get our students to launch great, creative, innovative ventures can connect them into the community, right? And if we can do that, everybody wins, right? How do we win as a university? Well, one, students who are, you know, have a bent towards an idea, an entrepreneurship venture, they're going to want to come to Furman, right? They're going to say, hey, there are the resources there that are going to give me the best platform to launch this venture, right? Mentors, access to capital, co-working space, you name it. And then, so the university wins in that we're recruiting the best talent, innovative talent. The students win because they're getting equipped. And the community wins because if we can pump those students out into the community and they're launching their ventures here, South Carolina wins big, right? And so I see it as a continuum of connecting the university into the community. Yeah, and how, how, talk a little bit about it. I'd love to know how, you know, there's there's a big debate. You, you look at Apple and Google who are, they've announced that they're no longer just looking at college graduates. Elon Musk has said the same. Um, and, you know, I've interviewed folks on this program who said, you know, do you think that higher education right now or college is really equipped you to be an entrepreneur, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I kind of look at, sometimes I look at it in my own mind as a difference between like, you know, traditional warfare with tanks and aircraft carriers versus cyber warfare or the war of tomorrow, right? Right, right. If, if you're building up an army to fight a, a land war, but really the next war is going to be cyber terror or whatever, are you really going in the right direction? So when you look at higher education, and we've had offline discussions about it's a big behemoth, right? And and there's a lot of entrenched interests. How do you, within that behemoth, kind of get your tentacles through the university to make that happen, right? Because there's, I don't know how many majors you have and different departments the university has, and then there's you in the middle. How do you kind of, uh, I hate to use the term today, but it, you know, infect it like a virus with your entrepreneurial virus to really get throughout the university and, 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 and be felt as a force. Yeah. You know, one of the things I just got off a, a, another meeting with um, some leaders here in the state and we were talking about aligning agendas, right. And partnering. And that's really how we look at our Institute just on campus, right. With the different departments, you know, the English department, the history department, um, we think, okay, what is their agenda? What are they trying to achieve? Right. They're trying to, you know, educate students, empower them, develop them, grow their, you know, their, their mindset and, you know, and make them, you know, prepared for a life, you know, a fulfilling life. Right. Well, our mission is to develop innovative leaders, right. And entrepreneurs. And so what we're trying to do is, okay, how can we align our agendas um, and go to these departments and say, what are your pain points? What are you trying to do? And how can we come alongside and help you do it better? Right. And so that's a different message than saying, Hey, send us your students. We want to help them launch ventures, right? It's very one-sided, right? And so I think that's such a critical thing in higher ed. But even in, you know, like I said, I've been in different organizations, large organizations, corporations, and, you know, success in my career and my teams has always been, do you go to another division, another department, and do you press on your agenda on them? Or do you ask them, what are they trying to achieve? And how can you help? You know, and then how do you overlay your agenda on that? And if you can do that, if you can align your agendas, what starts to happen is what? They start to trust you. 
right? The diversity thing happens because you now have a new perspective into that division. They're listening to you. They're hearing you out and they want to allow you to come alongside and partner with them. And that's when innovation comes about, right? It's, it's these collisions that are happening. Yeah, I love that because, you know, on this program, we've talked a lot recently about the word influence and impact and how some people think of influence as, you know, the influencer culture, you know, people who do selfies and sell wristwatches or something on Instagram, or they think of influence as I'm going to press down on you and force you to do something that you wouldn't otherwise do. But we've had a number of guests and talking about influence really is having a positive impact on those around you, which is exactly what you're talking about, right? If you, if you can go in there instead of saying, you do this, right? Entrepreneurship and innovation by, tyranni by tyranny, <laughs> you know, or dictatorship. <laughs> I, I guess that, that, that is the antithesis of, of what it really should be. No, you're totally right. I, I, the influence thing that this boggles me. I have a friend that is an influencer on Instagram and he literally gets paid to post a picture of this company's product. And I literally, I said, Hey, what do you, why are you promoting that? Cause it's some, a product he would not use. And he goes, yeah, every time I post, I get 2,500 bucks. So Kurt, you and I have to figure out how to break into that game. You know, I, I was thinking maybe I can do something for, um, something, some hair product and I'll be an influencer that way. Yeah. But, yeah. Me, me, yeah. You and I both, right. Yeah. We can, oh, yeah. we can, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll sell combs or something like that. If, if we can grow it back, so can you, <laughs> but no. you know, yeah. Oh, please, please. Yeah, no, go, but back to your question. Yeah. It's all about, you're right. It's influencing and buying trust. And, you know, I'll give you an example. My first semester here at the university, we had a department, I'll tell you that it was a classics department, right? And they, they said, we want to do a summit on the future of, you know, of classics, you know, and innovation. Hmm. And I was like, in a whole, it was a one day summit. They're all their faculty. And we just talked about what the future was going to be like and how does, you know, the classics innovate and what does that look like? And, and I thought that was such a fascinating stance and very innovative by that, those faculty members to say, how do we adapt? How do we change? How do we take our discipline and how does it fit in to innovation? Because I believe wholeheartedly that at the heart of innovation are those type of studies that you find in the humanities. And so I think it's a yeah. it's a, um, a critical thing for individuals to do. So a lot of it is, yes, it's, it's building influence. Yeah, it, it, the classics, it's interesting. I, and, and I didn't learn much about the classics. I, I went to, a, a, in my high school, actually, we did. But, you know, it, I was a political science major. And, you know, you, you get to college and you kind of find your, your, your path and then you can avoid certain things. But it's interesting that the, the, some of the most true learning I've done has been after age 40. And then I sit down, I'm reading, you know, the, the stoicism, I'm reading the Tao, I'm reading Plato, Socrates. I just took a course on Socrates, you know, and, it, and it's interesting how those apply more in many cases to my business than some of the things that are, you know, these business books or self-help books or things like that. Um, so that's fascinating. Where, where do you see higher ed? I know this is like a, a you know a very large and company. In where's it going? But you know what's yeah, going to like ten Everybody, years from now, you know. <laughs> where's it going to go? One semester from now, I think is yeah. really. The you know, I think, yeah. and this, I'm going to go ahead and put a disclaimer here, right? This is Anthony Herrera's opinion. This is not the the, the opinion of Furman, you know, university, right? But like I said, I've been at three different universities. I've been in corporate America, and my perspective. That's what's driving my perspective, right? And seeing to your point, these large technology companies coming out and saying we're not needing a degree anymore, right? They've, they've taken that off as a requirement to work for, for their organization. So where does that leave higher ed? Uh, I, what the pandemic has done is not, you know, it's not disrupting um, the you know, higher ed for the first time. It's only accelerating what was already happening, right? We knew in North America, there was a shrinking population. We just take North America as a pool. Um, it was a shrinking population of high school students going into college. Right. And so there was our and what is I think there's over what, 40, 4,000, 4,600 universities in North America. Um, the average endowment, seven million dollars. And so you think this pandemic, what it did and, and higher ed business model is not a great model. Right. You know, it's uh, they, almost, they live uh, every day where they kill what they eat. Right. So if they don't have students on campus paying for, you know, residence halls and meal plans and tuition. They're not going to survive. They can't keep their payroll, right? They just they just don't have this huge cash reserve, um, and so I think this pandemic accelerated what was already happening, right? You know, the shrinking population, the the demand by the customer, right? The students and their parents of 
hey, we need you to prepare our students for the workforce, right? And I don't want to get in. There's a, a huge debate, and is, is that the purpose of the university, right? Is mm -hmm. to prepare for workforce, or is it to prepare them and develop them as human beings? Um, I think you can do both, right? And you should do both. And so then that's why my philosophy is, is higher ed going to go away? No, because there's not a another mechanism that exists today that can take a 18 year old to, you know, a 25 year old. I think the average age is 25 years old in higher ed in North America mm -hmm. um, is, is there, there's not a better mechanism we have right now to do that development, right? Really what it's become is a developmental, um, you know, season for somebody's, uh, you know, life. And in fact, I remember hearing, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine, they have a college kid at, at another university and their kid kept calling. They dropped him off last week at their university and the kid kept calling him, asking questions. And the mother just said, uh, stop calling me, call your RA. You know, <laughs> it was like, okay, we've shifted the development and that's what higher ed had to become, right? It's like, we're, it's like we're, we became babysitters in a, in a, in, in a way. Um, but where is it going? I think we have to, you're going to see winners and losers, right? The winners are going to be strong brand universities that have had a history of um, putting students and connecting them into elite organizations, right? Those organizations, like you said, the Googles of the world that they want to work for, they're going to be fine, right? Because they have um, a long list of people wanting to get into those universities. They probably have a significant endowment that can fund a lot of the programs they have. And um, they have they can diversify their revenue streams. Um, the middle tier colleges, you know, are going to get squeezed, right? Because they're not going to have the luxury of those things I just said for the top tier course colleges. And then the bottom tiers, those are the ones that are going to lose big, right? They don't have the endowments. They don't have multiple revenue streams. They're going to have a shrinking application base, um, and they're going to start to, you know, you're going to start to see them close down. You're already seeing that happen. And that was that was before COVID, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what, what do you and, and I assume you know? Well, right now with COVID, we're seeing economic forces have a greater impact than what you're even talking about. Um, but some of this will probably be determined over the next five years, from uh, especially sped up because of COVID by economic forces and pressures related to the student loan and financing kind of bubble crisis, whatever you want to call it, I would assume, because there is that debate of, of what is, what's the purpose of education as a whole? I don't think this is just higher ed, right? Is, is the purpose of high school just to get you into college? And is the purpose of college just to get you a job? And I know you, you said it's both. So with that, if it is both, are you going to see some of these things where people are getting pretty hefty student loans for majors that probably will never... <laughs> And and you don't have to nod or anything, but, but we'll never. <laughs> don't you know, get me we'll, fired, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll never get you a job. You know, do, do you know what I mean? I mean, there there's a. I won't I won't pick on any specific here, but but will there be greater pressures, especially if that bubble bursts? I mean, we saw what happened with the housing crisis. Now, nothing really seemed to have changed with the banks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but if that happens with higher ed, I personally think it would make the housing crisis especially if it happened now with what's going on with COVID look like a walk in the park. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my perspective on this is that what you're going to see is I, I think those majors that, you know, and you can put a list out there of, of, of what you think are not preparing you for workforce. Right. I, I disagree. I think those majors do prepare you for the workforce. I think what we haven't done as universities and colleges is, is we haven't helped the students connect those skill sets into the workforce. Right. So let's talk about that. Right. You know, you think about a human, you know, liberal arts colleges have been getting slammed for, you know, several years about, you know, uh, for this topic. Right. But you flip the coin and you go talk to corporate America and you talk about what are the skill sets they're looking for, you know, or you talk about as they promote into leadership ranks. Right. I led, you know, leadership development for, you know, for Toyota in North America. And we were not talking about, hey, does this person know how to code or do they have an engineering degree or, you know, you know, STEM? It was you know, how strong are their communications? You know, are they able to influence and inspire? You know, are they able to problem solve, right? Those are the skill sets you learn in those liberal arts education, right? You know, dealing with ambiguity, problem solving, communication skills, those are at the core of mm -hmm. liberal arts education. And so I think where the gap has been is we haven't connected the dots. We haven't, you know, I think it comes back to branding, right? We haven't branded ourselves and say, we do better at positioning students for the workforce 
than a business school or an engineering school or a technical school. Um, yeah. Now, what we got to connect that and we got to brand it and we got to help our students be able to communicate that. But we also have to equip them. And I like to say this, we got to complement their liberal arts degree. Right. We got to give them, you know, a you know, this this degree that they have in humanities. And then we got to you know, complement it with a technical skill. Right. I think God, yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine uh, about his son. You know, he's, he's at a private school university and he said, I think he's going to study history. And, and, you know, and he's like, I don't know what he's going to do with that. And, and, I, and I said, you know, he's fine. Right. Here's my recommendation. When you go to college, you're paying a lot of money to your point. Higher ed, you're getting debt. You should be doing at a minimum two majors. Right. You should be doing a passion major and a mm. practical major. And I think if you can have that as a golden rule where you're going to say, OK, I'm going to learn, you know, if I learn, I want to learn a language, I'm going to go study German and I'm also going to, you know, do you know math or computer science or, you know, you name it. That's a high demand skill. Um, however, I also think universities can start to provide those skills outside of the classroom. Right. You know, doing a better job of connecting students into companies that will not only kind of give them apprenticeships or also certificate programs. Things that they can do accelerated to learn coding, you know, business skills, you know, engineering skills. And so I think that's the future. And I think this pandemic is going to force universities to adapt. Right. You know, we know this. When do we adapt? Right. We adapt. You know, I change my habits in my household when my when my wallet gets hit. Right. You know, I stop buying things. I I cut things out. um, But I don't change any of my habits at home until my wallet gets it. And I think that's what's, what's happening with higher ed. And they're going to change. They'll, they'll adapt. We'll adapt. We've got smart leaders. Um, but, you know, not everybody's going to adapt in time, you know? Yeah, no, I, and I, and I love that, uh, that response overall about, about being able to, about connecting the dots between whatever your major is and, and that, that not just liberal arts to other things, but there's probably a lot of engineering students and, and folks uh, in the sciences who could use better communication skills and know how to how to express their ideas, right? And and because as we've seen, some of the most innovative, smartest people, if if you can't express that idea, it's like a tree falling in the woods with no one around to hear it, right? So, um, yeah, that that that's that's fascinating. You mentioned being on a call earlier about you know with some folks here in the state of South Carolina. I'm obviously partial to the state of South Carolina being a resident here, you know, and I'm, I'm originally from a state, uh, Illinois, which it's interesting seeing the differences between a state like Illinois and a state like South Carolina. And, and, and we have folks that come and visit and, it, and it's interesting, you know, there's, there's still after all these years after the civil war, right? There's still this North South divide. I mean, it, we're seeing it now in media, et cetera. But it's like we're moving down to South Carolina. It's like, wow. We had relatives. You know, my my wife was pregnant at the time. Well, how are the facilities down there? (laughs) It's like, oh, well, my wife's going to squat in a swamp and just plop out the baby. You know, we have no (laughs) facilities here. We have whatever. It's like the Medical University of South Carolina is an incredible facility, you know. And, and, And so you see this difference. But we have relatives who visit here and they're like, it's like, it, it's like you're living in the future down here. And I go back to, there's nothing being built in Illinois and all that. And I can say that as a resident and people get mad at me for saying that. It's like, listen, that's, that's my viewpoint and the viewpoint of some others. And if you look economically, the, the data really speaks for itself, where people are moving outward migration right. versus where people are moving in. And um, so you work a lot with the state of South Carolina and before COVID, but I think even when you saw the, the initial numbers, uh, in June, kind of when we started coming out of the lockdown, whether we're going to go in and out, I, I have no idea, but we were pretty strong in the ability to kind of punch back and fight right. back. Why do you think South Carolina is so well positioned pre COVID post COVID, whatever, in terms of bringing in aerospace, you know, Boeing, bringing in Volvo, uh, you know, BMW up near, uh, where you're located, uh, Mercedes, you know, all these incredible companies, Michelin, why is South Carolina bringing these people in? Yeah. And other States are saying, no, no, no. It's just low income jobs. They're just these low income non-union jobs. It's not worth it. But I'm sitting here thinking I'm, I'm living here thinking we are growing, we're building, we're, we're, we're thriving. And, 
other states are not. You're, I think, I mean, South Carolina wins big. I think, you know, and, and other mid-sized, you know, states and mid-sized cities win big um, uh, post-pandemic. And, and But w- what was going on, right? I think what you've seen, it was a generation um, that, you know, especially the millennial generation, the professionals, you, you started to hear them say they wanted to get out of these big metropolitan state, you know, cities, right? And these high-tax states. And they want to have a more balanced life, right? They want to have access. You know, I, I, I am 60 minutes from a mountain, I'm two hours from a beach. You know, I, I've tripled the size of my house moving from Dallas to Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and I didn't change my price point. It's unreal, right? And so you think about the end of my commute went from literally, you know, I was driving less than 15 miles in Dallas, of an hour to an hour, 20 minute commute each way to my commute's 10 minutes. And during the pandemic, it's nothing, right? I'm sitting at home, right? But, you know, and so right. I think what you saw was this migration of people saying, I want a higher quality of life. I want access to, you know, the, you know, the environment to be able to go hiking, you know, fishing, you know, to the beach. Uh, I want a better um, cost of living. And, you know, and I want to be able to give back to the community in a meaningful way. And I think that's why South Carolina has some great mid-sized cities, you know, between Charleston, you know, you got Columbia coming up strong, you got Greenville. Um, I think these states went big and um, this pandemic accelerated that, right? What did it do? Well, it made overnight an entire workforce go remote. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, every organization said, hey, that works. And so you're, we're going to see people flocking here, you know, because they can say, well, I, I can work for Google and do it in Greenville, South Carolina. And, you know, by five o'clock, I can be in the mountains in 60 minutes, you know, and, and, and do my hobbies. And so I think that's what we're going to see. And that's going to drive, I think, even more jobs here because we're going to get not only we're going to get these what, you know, you said, maybe they're not the highest paying jobs of some of these manufacturing jobs. But we're going to have those and we're, those are going to grow and those are going to innovate. Right. Those companies are innovating. And so those those jobs, their, their salaries are going to go up. But then we're going to get this highly educated workforce moving here and bringing those jobs here as well. And so I think South Carolina wins big post pandemic. Yeah. And Jessica Healy, she comments, she's here in South in Charleston. She said, we work alongside Michelin Bosch. Bosch is another company and other manufacturers, distributors in South Carolina. I mean, Google, Amazon are down here in Charleston. It's nuts. We have an incredible port. The port is is nuts as well, which services BMW. I mean, we regularly see and we walk across the bridge here, the Ravenel Bridge, and we see those cars being loaded on to the tankers going out, going through the Panama Canal, bringing them around the world. Um, and you just see that commerce. Even, even during the pandemic, we watched, I took my two sons, we walked across the Ravenel Bridge and you can physically see the commerce happening right. here. And, and, and it's amazing. And it's, it's, uh, the diversity of, of rail, you know, especially the rail from, from where you are down here to Charleston, uh, the port, it, it's really tech, you know, they, everything's Silicon now, but they call it Silicon Harbor, but you all to, to that point, I mean, you mentioned the, the mid-sized cities and, and some of these States, I mean, the competition that exists and you see chambers kind of friendly competitions or not so friendly between like a, even a, a, a Raleigh Durham and a Charleston right. uh, or Greenberg Spartanburg or Greenville Spartanburg, uh, a Jacksonville, uh, even like uh, Birmingham, Alabama right. is really coming on strong. And it's, it's really amazing to see that happening and the mindset. And, and one big piece is the, the, the governors of those states and, and the powers that be in the, in the state governments working with folks like you and working with higher ed to ensure that, like you said, collision, making sure you have the resources to grow in that partnership. Can you talk to and speak to how how you and and other folks in the state university higher ed are working? What's that two-way relationship like with government? And and why is that so important? Yeah, well, Kurt, it's such a timely question. In fact, that was my, I was in a Zoom meeting and I was presenting on behalf of South Carolina Commerce and their innovation office to an audience on public-private partnerships. (laughs) <laughs> and why they're so critical. So this is so timing because that's what it is, right? When you think about how do you create an innovative city? How do you create an innovative you know, state? Is you have to have all three major stakeholders all on the same agenda, right? All moving in the sa- same direction and working together. And that is one, civic, right? So you need your state officials, your cities, your chambers. 
you need corporate, right? When I say corporate, I'm saying big C, right? You know, your Bosch, your Prismas, your Michelins, your BMWs, your Volvos, all of them on that corporate environment. And then you need the academic universities, right? All of us have to work together, right? Because we all bring different assets and resources to create this culture of innovation, which grows economic development um, and prosperity for everyone, right? And that's such a key thing, right? If we're going to move forward, we got to make sure there's prosperity for everyone, you know, everybody on the social economic scale, right? The resources need to be there. And, and all three of those entities have to be working together. And I think what you're seeing in South Carolina, there is that interest and it's happening of people working together, right? You know, it's com- you know, commerce into the conversation. I love this because she had a- she invited me and my colleague Brian uh, on my team to come present these partnerships and how has it worked. And they have a grant program, right? They give out funding to entities to pilot innovative projects. And she ended and she said, I want you guys to know, this is Commerce Department saying it here in South Carolina. She goes, I want you to know, she was like, we're highlighting Furman and what they're doing in these public-private partnerships. But she goes, and they're not even eligible for our grants, right? Because we're a private university, right? They can't give us any money. And she goes, but yet they have figured out still how to partner, even with us, to help the agenda, help the mission. And so uh, that's that's what's key. And, and, and what we were talking about, so how do these public-private partnerships work? How do these get delivered is you have to align everybody's agenda, right? You have to say, okay, what are, what's our mission? What's our goals? What are we trying to achieve as firm in an innovation and entrepreneurship? And like I said, it's to help launch student ventures, get them into the workforce or get them starting ventures. Um, and then we got to go to the other entity, the other partner and say, what are they trying to achieve? And we had a perfect one this summer, right? We partnered with the city of Greenville next, uh, which is an incubator here in town, accelerator and firm in innovation. And we, we, we had a boot camp. We had 42 students, and then we had 10 paid internships with 10 member companies that were startups under Next, and the city helped us fund it. So we were all kind of contributing, and we all had the same objective, right? Prosperity and economic development, but we were all still, a byproduct was still meeting our own missions and values. That that really is uh, great. I, I, what have you noticed different, uh, or, or is it full steam ahead with COVID? you know, in terms of working with the state? I mean, certainly there's, it's out there, but but ha- have goals changed? Have outcomes changed? I mean, certainly, uh, I don't know what's going on in Furman in terms of how many students are going to be there versus virtual and all that. But in terms of working with the state, is it kind of like, wait, we got to re- we got to redo all our goals or is it we're moving forward and we're focused on growth and we're going to wear masks while we grow <laughs> or whatever it is and, and come what may, but we're pushing forward. No, I love it. <laughs> Our, our objectives have not changed, right? We've had to adapt, right? You know, if we were going to do a program and it was going to be in person, it's doing virtually now. But we can't just say, hey, we're going to do this virtually. It has to be a great program. It has to be delivered very well, right? And that's the key, what you're seeing in higher ed right now. Some universities are saying, we're going to put the resources to deliver quality programs. And some are saying, hey, this is only a blip. It'll be over in a year or something. We'll be back in person. And I think those are the ones that are going to pay big time because, you know, I think there's always going to be a demand now for virtual learning. Um, And so for us and our partnerships, it's full steam ahead, right? We're putting on our mask. In fact, we just launched our own mask. We have Furman Innovation Life's a Pitch, (laughs) P-I-T-C-H, mask, because you should always be pitching, right? You're pitching yourself for a job interview. You're pitching yourself for a date. You're pitching yourself for fundraising. And so... Um, I, that we haven't changed our, uh, our programming. It's just how we're delivering them. And in fact, the key is this, they're needed now more than ever, right? What do you see going on? You go down main street, unfortunately there are, you know, here, main street here in Greenville, you, you have businesses that may not be around in 60 days. Yeah. Right. They have to pivot. Right. And, you know, the city has a platform to support them but they need the higher ed institutions to come around and maybe deliver curriculum in a new way, in an accelerated way, in a certificate program way that can help that individual, that business owner adapt and move forward. And if we do that, who wins, right? Well, we win because we're delivering education, right? We're delivering on our mission as a university. Two, the business owner wins because they can pivot, survive and sustain and grow. They're gonna be hiring people, creating economic development, paying taxes, therefore the city wins. And that's why I think now, these partnerships are going to be more critical, but we have to move fast. And that's probably really the key is we're, you're talking about organizations that are highly bureaucratic <laughs> and it's going to come down to leaders in each of those organizations. 
if the leaders can create that culture of innovation, you're going to see success all the way around. You're an innovation guy, but you, you know, you were at keep KPMG. So I assume you're also sort of a numbers guy, right? When you look at what's, what's happening now, and it's like, I'm a, I'm a pretty positive person, but you know, my dad grew up during the great depression. I grew up with stories of kind of worst case scenario of what could happen. And so like with my financial folks and my numbers, I was always thinking, what if, what if the worst case scenario happened? What if a nuclear bomb hit? What if, you know, I remember 9-11 and I remember what happened after 9-11, you know, the 2007, 2008, and people would always be like, oh no, everything's going strong. Everything's fine. It's going fine. And I made some decisions because of my looking at worst case scenario that I, I feel pretty good right now. You're seeing right now, like you mentioned, some some smaller businesses, but there's some larger businesses out there that you've seen declare for bankruptcy, right? And I say this with all due respect, and some people will probably get mad. You know, uh, I didn't grow up around hurricanes, but we we have hurricanes and tropical storms here. And what's interesting to see is nature kind of take its course here. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of trees. And we'll see when the storm comes through, the branches right. that should be off the trees when the storm comes through, naturally take them off the trees. So I don't have to pay someone to do it, right? The tree gets stronger, et cetera. I feel like you're seeing that with businesses that maybe weren't being run that well and be, they weren't equipped to hit. Now, there's some businesses that probably were considered strong by standards of a good economy that are now hanging. What, what do you see happening over the next five or 10 years where innovation and entrepreneurship inherently is moving forward, taking some risk? But right. now we've kind of seen, I don't, this isn't the worst case scenario, but it's pretty darn bad. What do you see moving forward? Kind of that is risk tolerance going to be lower now? Cause you want, you want that. I mean, this is America, right? right? We've been focused on, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to do it. But are people going to be, is this culture of fear going to affect entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial ecosystems within companies moving forward of, we got to hoard money now. Well, you right. know, our balance sheet now has to be twice as good as it was before. Yeah. I think that's a great question. I think what you're seeing, I love telling the story, right? You know, you, you remember Nokia? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nokia had like, I think it was like over close to 50 to 60% market share back in the early 2000s, right? You know, cell yeah. phone, right? You know, I have, I have an iPhone, right? Right. But I used to have Nokia. We all had Nokia and, and it was in everybody's pocket, right? I mean, I'm close to over 50% market share globally, you know, hundred and 30 you know thousand employees i think they were like 70 billion in revenue i mean killing it and then in 2013 you know what their numbers were they were like a third of that of employees they were less than i think 20 billion in revenue and they had less than 10 percent market share yeah and you can google it there's a quote right uh the ceo came out they had to sell right they sold themselves to microsoft and during that press conference, the CEO of Nokia comes out and he says, and crying, he said, we didn't do anything wrong, but we still lost. Hmm. And what he was saluting to is, yeah, they didn't do anything wrong, but they didn't change. And you have to be willing to change. And I think that's at the heart of this, right? When we, we talk about risk, what is risk? It's, risk is saying we're going to change. We've got to be able to adapt, right? Higher ed, if we don't change... You know, what's going on? I, you know, I love, I think you and I talked offline one time about Steve Galloway up at NYU. And he yeah. loves to say, like, when you look at like healthcare and emergency room, nothing's changed like in 50 years, really materially. And then if you look at a, an education, the classroom hasn't changed in 50 years. However, in the last three weeks, I know at Furman they have, I mean, we have more technology now in a classroom than we've ever had in the history of the university, right? So that's great. But I think that's at the heart of it. We have to be willing to change not only to be relevant and survive, but to be successful, right? And to, and to create growth. And um, you're going to see that go on in every organization, right? I think what you're going to start to see is, you know, universities have chief innovation officers, mm -hmm. right? That are not doing necessary student programs, but they're looking, okay, what are the assets of the university? And how do we create value with that in a new way that we've never done before? You're going to see corporations say we're going to, you know, they have chief innovation officers, but they've always treated it as, hey, you're over here. You do your little thing, maybe offsite. It's not the core of the business. 
and you know we'll fund it as long as you don't interfere with our corporate business, right? And I now they're going to bring that internal and say innovation needs to be in all of our business, whether it's in the accounting department, HR department. It's not just reserved for R and D, um, because I think what they're going to start to see is it's if we don't change and adapt and have somebody that's full time, a team, a division, an organization, full time thinking about the future. When the next pandemic or the next you know recession happens, it's going to obliterate a lot of our organizations, right? And so I, I think, like I said, I'm going to go back to this. I think dollars, my revenue, right? The sustainability of an organization, which is financial, will drive this change because they, you just can't ignore it. That that's a, I remember I had a friend whose uh, b- entire business. I mean, his biggest client was Nokia, and I remember when they went away, he was forced to change his business. You know, so you think of Nokia, but everyone who serviced Nokia as well. And I, I, growing up in DuPage County, Illinois, I remember another company, Lucent. Yeah. And Lucent had built these huge. They looked like spaceships, uh, huge ultra modern buildings in uh, like right around Lyle, uh, Naperville, Illinois. And within a few years gone, I think, um, well, they're not, Navistar, I think bought one or two of the buildings now, but I mean, just gone, like ghost towns. It's like They look like those, those ghost cities in China. Um, but another company I, I thought of, and this is kind of an aside, but block, you know, Blockbuster and everyone <laughs> talks about Blockbuster and, and, and not doing those, but uh, even, even. Well, Blockbuster is great, right? Because, I mean, they had the opportunity to buy Netflix. Yeah. For, like, was it like $50 million? Or I think it was something like that, right? So you think about what Netflix is worth today, you know, of being one of the fang, right, in the in the stock market. And, you know, and Blockbuster had that, you know, that opportunity. And what, you know, I bet you go ask that CEO, he would probably say the same thing. The CEO of Blockbuster, he said, we didn't do anything wrong. We just didn't want to change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it, the funny part is there's one Blockbuster left. It's in Bend, Oregon. And I don't know if you saw this, but they've been going. They've they've just kept open. I mean, it's an independent deal. Two weeks ago, they decided this one video rental store in Bend, Oregon, which is supported by the local community, and it's kind of a thing. And they 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 post on Twitter. Obviously, they've probably been hurting in the pandemic. Right. Mom and pop, they turned their blockbuster into an Airbnb. Got national right. coverage. You could go on Airbnb and rent it. I got on there. Four months, it's every day. There's no available days. I think they're renting it out. So it's funny, even that small mom and pop blockbuster, is, is, there's some sort of symbolism there for what we're talking about, right? This small mom and pop video rental place, they had to innovate even within themselves and now they're making money as an, as an Airbnb rental. It's kind of funny. You know, it's so crazy because that's what it is. And that's why I think innovations will happen across all types of organizations and industries because they're to survive, right? And and, you know, you see that even with restaurants, right? You're seeing restaurants now who were traditionally dine-in only creating packages that you can order and have your own experience at home. And they put everything in a box, right? Or the drive through and how they're managing that. But you also have those who are not. They're, they're sitting back and they're saying, this is temporary. We got our, you know, our, our PPP loan and, um, you know, we'll wait this out and they're just not going to survive, right? And so... Um, I, I think this is a fascinating time. I, I, I honestly think the pandemic, you know, from a organizational standpoint, right? It's been traumatic on us. It's been sad and it's killing people. But on the organizational side, it is going to create innovation that has been long overdue and needed. From some people, but like you said, some people are going to do what they've done. I had I had a, a former Survival client. Survival of the fittest, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you, you. We went to a restaurant last week uh, here in the Charleston area, and you know, they were. It was empty because people are still afraid to go. My wife and I aren't. We we go and we try to help the, the local restaurants, and we love going. I had one of the best old fashions I've ever had. The food was incredible. But you know what really struck me at the end was that, and they had created a system. You know, they only had two people working there plus the owner and they were, they were pushing forward and they were doing certain things, but the owner came out and and he said, and, and like you said, there's some places you go and it's almost like it's a chore 
to right. serve you during this time. He came out and he just gave us the most heartfelt thank you for coming and supporting us and giving us a chance. I said, that's the type of business I want to support, not the business who complains for being an essential worker. Oh, right. I have to go out and work. Well, then don't work. No one's forcing you to work. But those people, I, I think that's the difference between an abundance mindset and a scarcity mindset of, listen, yeah, it's hitting the fan right now, but we got to change. And yeah, maybe I have my PPP loan. Maybe, yeah, I think I can, I could wait it out and survive for six months or like Wild Olive here on John's Island. They have the most, um, they have it down pat. They turned into a drive through Right. And they have it going strong. And even though they've opened up inside, they said, actually, some nights, three quarters of their business is still the drive through yeah. And they have it. You know what they got? They got new, um, you know, touch-free. Uh, so it's not, you don't have to take the thing and sign your bill. You don't have to touch anything. You just stick like they have in Europe. They've adapted. And it's it's small little things, like you said, that adapt. But they're doing it. And, and they're, they're winning they're, big. Yeah. Right? I mean, you look at, I mean, they're saying there's a there's a coffee shop here in town in Greenville, and they had a drive through. They never really used it as much as they could. And through this whole pandemic, it's a private coffee shop. It's not Starbucks. Um, but they're they're having some of their best months ever in the history of their business. And it's all because of the drive through. Right. And I think what you're you're seeing is adaptation and the willing to do just incremental changes. I mean, look who's doing great. Chick-fil-A, right? If Chick-fil-A was running you know, our testing centers around the country. I mean, we would be getting tested, people tested as quickly as we need, right? I mean, you go and get lunch there. I mean, you can yeah. be in and out. Yeah, I, I drive up because my kid, you know, I have two little kids and they, that's what they want every day. And um, I'll drive up and I'm looking, I was like, I'm going to be sitting here for 30 minutes. And then five minutes later, we're on the drive home, right? We got our food and it's like, there was 20 cars in line in front of me. And they've just managed that. And I think, you know, they've, they've adapted a little, right? You know, I one day I just counted, they had 20 employees out on the on, outside in the drive through taking orders and flagging people through and bringing them out. And that's what it moved. And they, it was a little change, right? And um, and so now I think what you're going to see is those organizations that are willing to do it, they're going to win big. And, and and they're getting our loyalty. You're right. You know, when I, I, I've i gotten notes on my receipts now, nobody's ever written, you know, I mean, you get the occasional thank you or come again. But now it's like, we're so glad you came. We appreciate it. We hope to see you soon, Anthony. Like they now know me because I've gone more than once. And, you know, we're going to continue to go. It's, uh, the you know, one place that's always done that with the notes is, and you have one up near you and we have one uh, certainly down here is Hall's Chop House. Yep. And, you know, I don't know if they, I assume they did the same thing up near you, but, you know, high-end steakhouse, right? I think voted the top steakhouse in America. Incredible. And it was interesting where they, you know, they were shut down, but they turned into, and they're on King Street. It's not like they're an easy place to drive up, right? but they had a system where you could not only go and pick up your dinner and pick up wine, you could go buy one of their raw Allen Brothers steaks. Wow. They actually had made specific videos online with their people showing you how to prepare the steak at home. We did that for my birthday. And you see that they've been thriving and they opened up, we went to them, but they were one of the first places we went afterwards. Why? Because of the loyalty and because you, you businesses can, can get momentum, right? You get that momentum and it's just like sports, right? If you take a month off, you're going to be rusty, but you get that momentum going yeah. and you're top of mind and people get used to going. Yeah. You're losing some money for a couple months, but you get that momentum going and you're the first back. You're the first to recover when it, when it starts. And they're doing great. Th you know, you think, but they innovated, right? They changed, they adapted, they were safe there at Halls. I'm talking about Halls. My wife and I, we had our anniversary in June and we went there here in Greenville. I felt safer at Halls than I did in my house. Yeah. Right? There was like, you had your own little table, san hand sanitizer. There was, you stand up, there was a hand sanitizer next to the, to the, to yeah. the table. I mean, there was, everybody was, I mean, it was a great environment to your point. It was quality. They, they, they adapted and they made you feel part of a loyal customer, part of the family, part of the Hall's family. And by, and speaking of that, I hate to say, uh, I think yesterday, uh, Bill Hall, the founder, uh, passed away, oh, man. uh, founder of Hall's shop house, but uh, they got a, you know, they have a big family, they're expanding. So sorry. And, and thoughts and prayers to the Hall family. And he, he was always there. He was in my, my rotary club, uh, that I was a formerly member of, but, but they're doing great things. And if you visit, 
Spar- well, are they in Green? They're in Greenville, right? They're in Greenville, Greenville yeah. they're in Columbia. They got a few locations down here in Charleston. Make sure to go to Halls. It, it, Halls was actually one of the. Re- it was on our first ever vacation here, and it, it contributed to the experience. We're like, we're, we're moving to Charleston. We're moving to Charleston. <laughs> so, well, Anthony, um, before we go here, and and I want to thank you for joining. And I want to thank everyone who's been joining us here. We've had a number of viewers here on the live stream. If you're listening to this on the podcast. Follow me on LinkedIn. Go to Freedom Media Network on YouTube, on Twitter, Freedom Media Now, and you can join these discussions live and put and, and comments just like Jessica Healy's joined us. Thank you for your comments. Ari Weinstein from New York. We got Eric Farber, Matthew Gardner. We got Jorge Rosa Filho from Brazil. We got Eric from Texas. Thank you for everyone who has joined us here today. Anthony, I, I'd like to throw it out to you. We've talked about a number of the things that differentiate innovative and entrepreneurial com- companies and cultures within larger companies from those that aren't. For those listening, whether you're a solopreneur or an entrepreneur, whether you're a, a leader of a large company or a small company, what's one piece that you can, if you had, hey, I, I have one minute to give you some advice how to build an entrepreneurial innovative culture within your organization, large or small, what's that one piece of advice you would give them? Oh, that's great. What is be willing to learn from others, right? You know, we so much, you know, I, I have the, the opportunity to talk to so many business owners, so many entrepreneurs, so many nonprofit leaders, and they stick in their industry. They stick in their, um, their world and they're not looking outside for innovation. Hmm. Right. And I think we can learn so much from that. Right. I tell people, I think I shared this with you offline. I'm learning so much from Peloton. Interesting. Right. And what they're doing and how can we take what they're doing and overlay that on what higher ed can be doing on how they deliver content, on how they build a following um, and have created a subscription business. Right. And I think that's my biggest advice is we sen- tend to think of we look for solutions inward. And when I say inward, not just within your own organization, even with just in your own industry. And we should be looking outside and say, can we learn from, you know, when I was at Toyota, I, you know, we were looking at how do we learn from what American Airlines is doing or Pizza Hut or, you know, and just these different organizations and totally different industries and either partner with them or learn from them. And so that's my, my, my biggest advice is learn from others outside of your industry. I love it. I love it. Well, Anthony Herrera, thank you so much for joining. Listen, if, if anyone listening or watching wants to learn more about firm and innovation and entrepreneurship, where should they go? And we'll put this in the show notes, too. Yeah, absolutely. You can follow us online, all of our Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn at Firm and Innovation. All right. So I'd love to have you uh, reach out. You can reach me at anthony.herrera at Furman.edu. Kurt, this has been a great time. Enjoyed it. And we want to get you not only to campus, but also on our Class E podcast. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Anthony, thanks so much for joining us. Take care, Kurt. It's been great.